So I'm going to just do a quick introduction to uh, different phosphorus separation techniques or technologies uh, and spend most of the discussion today focusing on, on chemical phosphorus separation and, and relate that to some of the experiences here on, uh, on Michigan dairies. So the first question, there we go. Why consider phosphorus separation? And it, it really goes back to manure management. And phosphorus is, uh, in Michigan and in many, many states around the United States, is the limiting nutrient when it comes to mineral application. Uh, there's an imbalance in nitrogen and phosphorus in most livestock manures. So when you're applying for crop utilization, um, it's often hard to, to do one application that matches both the, the crop needs for nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, and just overall easing of manure management practices is another reason for phosphorus separation. A little background, uh, chemical precipitation of phosphorus uh, makes phosphorus insoluble. Of course, algae need soluble nutrients. Uh, the development of the technology was really driven in the 70s by the, the, the initiation of the Clean Water Act. Uh, the technology does come out of the wastewater industry, um, and, and we see a lot of uh, the information coming from there. One of the important things to consider when we talk about transferring technology from municipal wastewater to, to livestock manures, and particularly dairy in this case, is considering uh, the differences in, in the waste materials. Wastewater is a, a generally dilute uh, source of nutrients, dilute, dilute waste stream, typically 99, 98% water, and then some low quantities of, of BOD, carbon, chemical oxygen demand, nitrogen, and phosphorus. When we look at dairy manure in the right column, uh, it is a much more concentrated waste stream. Higher solids, uh, typically 10% is excreted, and then depending on what the manure collection and transfer collection and, and storage practices are, could go be higher solids or lower solids. But when it comes to COD, nitrogen, phosphorus, solids, you know, easily two orders of magnitude more concentration compared to that in wastewater. So, it's not something we can directly uh, correlate to wastewater. Uh, the technologies can be applied similar, but we need to consider the differences in the waste that are going to be treated. So typically, there's three categories or three areas for phosphorus separation. Um, biological, used very commonly in uh, municipal wastewater treatment. And it's simply the cycling of anaerobic and aerobic conditions to trick the microorganisms to, to, to take up more phosphorus than they normally would. Uh, and then those, those, those microorganisms can be separated out of the wastewater relatively easily. Chemical precipitation is another area, and that's the one we're going to focus on today, and that's the addition of, of some sort of binding, binding agent to, to tie up the soluble phosphorus. And, and in the case of most systems, it, it is a metal salt, um, some aluminum or iron, and, and calcium is another, another option, or lime. The, the third area is, is struvite formation, and that's the formation of a crystalline uh, that contains phosphate, ammonium, and magnesium. And, and this is something I think will be covered in a future webcast, so I won't even go into any more detail on that. So chemical phosphorus, separ chemical phosphorus removal. Uh, our phosphate is in, a, is in a negative state or uh, an anion, and the metal salts that we're using uh, are, are cations, and so we have that opposite, uh, opposite charges which attract and allow us to pull that uh, soluble phosphorus uh, out of suspension and bring it into a solid form. So the basic terminology for this technology is the first step uh, is to precipitate or coagulate the phosphorus, and that is, again, bringing that, that dissolved phosphorus into, into a solid form uh, by adding a metal salt, and typically what we see is uh, at first, it'll be the size of uh, the tip of your pen, and then it becomes, as it's mixed and, and grows, uh, curd-like uh, and a little bit thicker. And this is brought about by the addition of, of one of those metal salts or, or cations, and it's really charging neutral, neutralization that allows this to occur. Flocculation is where we take these very small mo molecules and add a polymer uh, that allows those to, to grow and become longer chain molecules. And again, it's just getting that phosphate particle into, or that phosphorus particle into a larger size that we can easily separate mechanically. Um, 
again, more destabilizing of the particles, uh, creating this dense flock uh, that now, if you put it into a glass, you could easily see separation of water in the solids. This is aided by polymers, and they can be natural polymers, they can be man-made polymers, there's a variety uh, that are used. It really depends on the site-specific conditions. The one thing that, that we need to be careful here as we design and utilize flocculation systems is uh, these polymers are generally very fragile. And so while we need to uh, provide some mixing to bring about this interaction, uh, overmixing does tend to shear the particles, and so it's a, it's a delicate balance, the amount of mixing that we use here. Once we form these flocks or, or, or flocculated the material, we can go about then separating it. Um, we can use passive separation techniques, but more traditionally or more commonly, we're going to use a mechanical separation. We've invested a fair amount of effort in the chemicals and the equipment to, to bring about uh, this molecule forming. It, it, we want to separate it in the most efficient manner. So typically, we'll see this, this, a belt filter press used here, dissolved air flotation or something similar. Out of slide out order. Hang on. So the equipment, um, again, just to give you some perspective, uh, the dissolved air flotation or DAF is simply a container or a vessel that has uh, air inserted in the bottom. We have a water body here, and then as that uh, the flocks float to the top, they're pulled off by skimmer paddles that you can see on the top. Bell filter press uses compression, and we're we're simply squeezing the uh, mix of material between two belts and compressing it, the water squeezes out the side or squeezes through the porous belts, drains to the floor, and, and we'll talk more about that. Passive, we can use clarifiers where, again, we're, we're, we're thickening the material using gravity as our passive separation mechanism. So factors impacting chemical separation, again, the, a pretty good laundry list of factors that can in, in influence uh, the process and, and enhance performance or, or decrease uh, returns. And they range through from, from the phosphorus level, uh, the alkalinity of the water, uh, chemical cost, climactic conditions, we've seen some influences there. From our few years of experience here in Michigan, um, in the suspended solids, the, the climactic conditions, uh, compatibility with other processes and changes in feed ration, uh, have had the most impact in chemical usage. Of course, uh, chemical cost is the real driver. Uh, when we start to look at what chemicals we're going to use, how it's going to be applied, um, there are two ways most of these chemicals come. One is they are manufactured, so they are met, uh, uh, developed to very specific specifications, uh, generally with no impurities. Those are slightly higher priced chemicals. In, in this case, I'm talking ferric chloride. The other option is to take byproducts from manufacturing. Uh, and, and again, being in Michigan, we have a fair amount of manufacturing, so we do have a lot of byproduct ferric chloride and ferrous sulfate available. However, when you take the byproduct material, uh, you do run the risk of other contaminants or impurities being in there, uh, and you do run the risk of heavy metals. And so some, sometimes we do see that used as a coagulant, but typically um, we are using manufactured uh, chemicals or manufactured coagulants in, in this case. So again, the, the basic equipment, as I, as I said, um, we need to provide the chemical insertion, the chemical injection, and then provide some level of mixing, again, sufficient to interact the particles, to grow the molecules to the size that we can separate, but not so intensive that we actually cause shearing and break those molecules back down. And in the separation devices, again, the belt press, the DAF are the most common, a clarifier, screw presses have been applied, and then basic settling cells as well. So our experience here uh, is dates back now a little, a little over 10 years. Uh, we've had three farms, three dairy farms that have installed uh, chemical phosphorus separations at different times and for, for slightly different reasons. Uh, the three farms, you know, 2002 to 2004 is when we've seen the most activity. A lot of the reason in the driver behind this was early 2000s is when Michigan enacted the NPDES or, or brought about the NPDES permitting for our livestock farms, for our CAFOs. And so this uncertainty of new regulation coming from Department of Environmental Quality here in Michigan uh, drove some farms to start looking at, at other ways to address manure management, seek new opportunities in utilizing manure as a, a, a commodity. 
The other was the Michigan Right to Farm Law in our generally accepted agricultural management practices, or GAMPs, which uh, oversee manure management, site selection of new farms or existing farms if they're expanding. And those were also changing slightly at this time to, to accommodate the new uh, discharge permits. So it was kind of some regulatory uncertainty that pushed these three farms to start looking at, uh, at new ways or different ways to manage manure. Farms specifically, uh, Green Meadows had an existing irrigation system. Uh, and they were concerned about manure management labor. They wanted to be able to utilize that irrigation system to uh, apply manure more timely so that they got better crop utilization, better crop yields, and avoid having to truck uh, manure great distances uh, using both fuel, labor, and equipment. Similar with Maple Road and consumers over manure application, they wanted to install irrigation, uh, reduce manure transportation costs, and improve crop yield. The last dairy is located very close to a, a fairly large city, and so they were concerned about potential uh, neighborhood, neighbor impacts or neighbor concerns, um, good citizen type things, and again, trying to reduce labor. If they could, all, all three farms felt that if they could irrigate the water, uh, again, it's a lower cost way to utilize those nutrients and a way to get those on growing crops and, and better utilize the nutrients. So the goals of the systems as they were developed by the farms were, one, to achieve a 90% phosphorus reduction in the effluent or in the liquid. That way, the limitation on, on applications to crop ground would be just strictly based on nitrogen, and they could apply liquid manure to achieve that nitrogen uh, need, but also apply a significant amount of the water needed for those growing crops. They were also looking for that 50% solids reduction. Again, having the solids out allows easier use of that water through irrigation systems in low odor. Again, applying this uh, throughout the hot summer months in Michigan, uh, we did not want to generate odors as we're doing that manure application. The separated solids, as or referred to as cake, we're again looking for a dry material here. So we want something that's stackable, storable, uh, does not leach, does not uh, the, create uh, that weeping effect or, or is very, very minimal weeping. They want the concentration of phosphorus, organic, and solids, so they've got a very uh, robust material, a very good fertilizer, something that's compostable, something that uh, is potentially exportable to landscapers or composters or other uh, parties interested in utilizing organic-based fertilizers. And of course, as with anything, uh, minimal chemical usage uh, and a cost-effective system. So those are the general goals uh, for the farms. So. Again, looking at the farm-specific uh, constraints or the farm-specific systems, Green Meadows uh, is a, a sand-based dairy. They do separate the sand. They do also have an anaerobic digester. Now, at the time, uh, in 2003, when the system went online, they, they estimated the, the operation cost, or I'm sorry, the chemical cost for the system to be about $73 per cow per year. Uh, Maple Row, relatively similar to their vacuum scraping manure to a central sand separation uh, and processing the entire manure stream under one roof. Uh, the Bradford dairy was slightly different. They used organic bedding, um, and, and they're using also the dissolved air flotation. Uh, their byproduct or, in, or their end product cake goes into composting or did go into composting. And at the time in 2003 that they installed the system, they estimated their, their operational chemical cost would be about $50 per cow per year. So with that, I'm going to switch, and I'm just going to focus on the Green Meadow system uh, for the next few slides and the remainder of this presentation. Uh, the Bradford system only operated for, I think, about 18 months, and, and they decided to go a different direction uh, than using the chemical phosphorus separation. Some of it related to mechanical troubles or mechanical challenges. Um, it was a very complex system with the, the dissolved air flotation to compost. And then the Maple Rose system does operate uh, did operate into the 2009, 2010, and, and is still operating periodically today. So Green Meadow Farms is a 3,500-cow dairy uh, located relatively close to Michigan State, uh, so it makes it easy for us. The dairy part is the, the, the buildings that I'm circling here. Their manure goes through sand separation at the sites and then is pumped to the anaerobic digesters here, uh, and then from there into the chemical phosphorus separation facility and then a storage that sits immediately uh, adjacent to that allows them to, to store manure and transfer it out directly to irrigation sites or to a longer-term storage that's located at a distance from the farm. The general process flow in the building is that manure enters uh, into a receiving area. Uh, 
it's held here for a day or so, depending on, on treatment trains and where things are at. As this material is pumped out of the, the untreated storage, chemical, or I'm sorry, ferric chloride is added to the stream and goes through some inline mixing. As it just reaches the bell press, the polymer is injected into the stream and then is allowed to flocculate through the rapid mix tank. Solids separate out and are conveyed out of the building to a stacking area. The liquid drops to an under, underground storage, is pumped through a rotary clarifier. Uh, the sludge that comes off that clarifier goes back and enters the untreated and makes its way back through the process. The clean water coming off or the, the treated effluent uh, just makes its way on out to storage and then, and then to land application eventually. So they are scraped collecting the manure. They go through sand separation at the sites. They do have both mechanical and passive systems um, to achieve a very high level of sand separation. Last uh, measure, they were achieving over 90% sand removal from the manure stream. Again, largely driven by the digester and the long storage times there. Uh, they do have a complete mixed anaerobic digester, three systems uh, operating as one uh, with about a 25-day HRT mesophilic. Chemical phosphorus separation sits immediately adjacent to that. The ferric chloride that they're using on this farm is an, is an acid, does require uh, secondary containment. So you see that in the large poly tank sitting on the left, and then the, the small uh, polymer makeup tank sit to the right. As manure is pumped out of that untreated storage, the ferric is added. It does go through a length of pipe, and then there's an inline mixer that also enhances interaction between the, the ferric and the, the dissolved phosphate. Then enters this rapid mix chamber. Uh, where the pollen is added, and it's given just a short residence time in mixing for the interaction to occur and for those polymer to grab onto the coagulated phosphorus and, and, and create larger molecules. From there, it's on to the belt press, where, again, you have a, a dewatering area sitting here horizontally, followed by the compression belt or the compression section, which uh, then squeezes the water out, and it does reach uh, pressures as high as uh, approximately 100 PSI at certain areas in there. The cake material, as it's called, or the separated solids, leave the belts, are dropped immediately onto a conveyor belt and directed out of the building. This is what it looks like, uh, very typical. It's, it's a very cohesive, um, almost slimy solid that stacks up in the sheet-like formation. And then from there, this farm uses it for their own land application for fields that are farther from the, the main site. Uh, they do haul it out as far as uh, 10 to 15 miles to, to cropland. A significant portion of this material is sold to a composter that, that uses it to create a bagged compost that you find in a lot of our uh, landscaping and, and nursery centers around the state and around the Midwest. The liquid effluent, as it leaves, again, goes through a rotary thickener that is just kind of a final polishing, uh, if, you'd, if you may, um, that removes any of those finer uh, molecules that may have passed out of the belt or squeezed out the ends of the belt or been sheared and weren't captured. Uh, it does thicken those and, and pull those out. The liquid drains out and then goes on to storage. Uh, some aeration is used to, to further control odor, but generally with the solid separation level that they are achieving, we're, we're seeing very little, very little odor on, on the stored material. And then they can irrigate this more or less on a year-round basis, or not a year-round basis, but a growing season basis. Um, and I can tell you from experience, you can park underneath the center pivot irrigation as it turns off, uh, and you get very little odor uh, from the from the effluent that's that's being irrigated. So, uh, to give you some perspective on cost for this system, um, as you can see on the the second column, this input, this would be the manure as it comes out of the digester, about four percent solids. And you can see about five, uh, five pounds per thousand gallons, six pounds per thousand gallons of, of uh, phosphorus oxide. The effluent from the belt press, very low solids, typically a half percent or less, uh, and very low uh, phosphorus oxide remaining. And then in the, the solids form, uh, we see relatively high pounds per ton of, of phosphorus oxide. If you convert that over to gallons, a significant increase compared to the influent. To their benefit, this material can then be irrigated and applied for pot or for nitrogen uh, application needs, which which typically, depending on the crop they're growing, could be 15 to 25,000 gallons per acre or or more. 
and then the solids are applied based on phosphorus, and, and they can match those to the needs and, and achieve a good level of organic matter in those soils. So their daily flow rate is on the order of 110 to 120,000 gallons per day. Again, it's a little bit higher than what you'd expect for this size dairy, mainly because of the, the water addition during the sand separation process. They do use the effluent uh, or lagoon manure, liquid, liquid from the manure storages to dilute the sand at a ratio of about one gallon of, of dilution or, or liquid manure to, to one gallon of new sand-laden dairy manure. So you get about a, you get a doubling effect of the, of the daily flow rate. They're using about 16,000 pounds of ferric chloride a day at a uh, cost of about a little over $1,100, and then organic polymer and defoamer to keep the system operating. Treatment cost per gallon is just over a penny. And in Michigan, when we talk liquid manure application, um, historically we've said anywhere from a tenth to a little over three, three, I'm sorry, one penny to a little over three pennies per gallon. Um, so it does fit, again, into that when you factor on application costs and labor, uh, this system is probably in that two to two and a half cents per gallon of, of total manure management and manure application. So technological challenges, of course, this is very high capital investment still. Um, there is a lot of uh, used equipment available from the municipal wastewater market, so so you can reduce capital costs by, by finding good used equipment. Chemical costs are, are, are a, a serious concern with the, the technology still, uh, and they are variable. During our uh, manufacturing shutdown in 2008-9, chemical costs spiked because there was no byproduct material on the market, so the manufactured materials became very expensive and, and in high demand. Again, maintenance, you're running high-pressure systems here. Uh, there is a fair amount of maintenance that goes into it. Again, you're also dealing with very um, sophisticated systems and, and very uh, uh, specific chemistry. So engineering is, is paramount in that uh, an improperly man engineered system could result in significant increases in the, the chemical usage because mixing was too much or insufficient uh, and you're not getting the performance you want. Training and system reliability was a, a steep learning curve early with them, but uh, since they, they figured out ways to, to make them work, work relatively well and they've, they've developed the training practices. Uh, benefits, they can easily achieve the 90% phosphorus reduction uh, and, and, and almost get to 100% there. Uh, very little freshwater consumption uh, in this, and they're able to use this uh, effluent from this as more of a gray water, so they're actually using less fresh water for flushing certain areas overall. So their, their total fresh water withdrawals have gone down because of the, the high quality of the effluent they get and their ability to recycle it. The marketing, uh, they're doing a very good job of marketing uh, the separated cake as a commodity, as a, a compost input. Very little odor, and of course we get a, a tremendous improvement in the, the timing rate, form, and placement of uh, the nutrients. So I think it's an innovative technology. Uh, we still need more experience, more research. We still need to figure out ways to make it more cost effective. Um, so there are a wide range of options. You, you don't have to have a system that achieves 90 plus percent phosphorus removal. We can design systems that have less than that. Uh, the other thing that we've experienced on this, because when they started in 2003, there was no digester. Uh, the digester went online in 2007. We did see some changes in the chemical usage uh, and actually to the benefit of the project because now on, a, on an everyday basis, they're dealing with the, the material that's coming into the input to the system is the same temperature, the same pH, the same flow rate. Uh, you don't get daily fluctuations. You don't get seasonal fluctuations in temperatures. So that has uh, made it easier to balance the chemistry of the system, which results in less chemicals being used. We still do see seasonal changes uh, when they go from winter to spring, uh, especially in the, in the fall months about this time of year when they're switching over from uh, one from last year's uh, feeds and silages to this year's. So that is still a bit of an issue, but uh, less than what it was prior to the digester. So with that, I guess I'll, I'll hand it back to Joe for final comments.